Um, so this is right. Um, so I've been in the industry for about 28 years, um, originally from the UK, worked with some of the biggest brands in the world, also dealt with a lot of indie um indie circles from a games perspective, both digital and board, um, and obviously not from a TTRPG perspective, but with in our industry, you can blend that to anything, anything that you do. So I've been in Australia for about nine years, and I'm the managing director and founder of Purpose, um, and we're very much a results-driven agency. Hello, um, I'm Joey. You may or may not have seen me around in the ARC Discord, and um, you may have also seen me as an enforcer at PAX Oz. Uh, I am a huge fan of play by post TTRPG, but um, I also do a lot of play testing and one shots in traditional TTRPG. Uh, so I enjoy a lot of the writing and um, the art. So I also do art. Um, here at Purpose, I'm a graphic designer. So um, I deal with a lot of the artwork and getting stuff to print. Um, so I think that there's several subjects that we're going to cover this evening. And I think that there's a couple of them that, from our perspective, it's super exciting to be part of this because... You know, I think that when you look at sort of TTRPG and the game development, for us, it's all about getting results. You know, we're all creatives. I mean, there's a, you know, sort of everybody online is, um, you know, sort of very creative. And I think that when we look at sort of what people want for success, normally everything we do is built by data and insight and um, consumer behavior. So whether we've got a window cleaner coming to us or whether we've got a game developer coming to us, you know, there's an initial idea and a foundation and, you know, you spend hours and days and months creating what it is that you, you know, you do. And I suppose if I was to ask each and every one of you what success would look like, it'd all be probably a little bit different because you've all got different wants and needs. But I think this is the one thing that is pretty critical to success um, because it may be that, you know, success to one person is the fact that there's a, a plethora of people that are playing their games and, you know, bringing um, their creative ideas to life and thoroughly enjoying the game and, uh, you know, whereas to another, and money, money is second, However, from, from our perspective, you know, the, the role of any marketing agency is to provide success. And yes, we might get, um, you know, it could be hundreds, it could be thousands, it could be millions of people playing your games. And your success, again, that may be great, but, you know, money is also important, you know, and there's other things that are going to come into the wants and needs of each and every developer. So when we're working with any game developer or whether we work, you know, or any business that comes to us, for us, it's about how can we, you know, sort of succeed. We think about the audiences. We think about, you know, we always think about money from a, you know, from a success of a client perspective. Um, so I think it's really important when we're going through these things, and obviously we spoke to three game developers now and, you know, spoke about how they could potentially bring their life, uh, bring their games to life a little more, because when you're producing a game and you've got a book or cards or whatever it is that you display, and let's take PAX as an example, you know, you've, you've got so many people in your target pool everybody I mean you've got captured audience I mean it's pretty amazing but everybody there whether they're for one day or three has got an agenda it might be a bit fluid because you know there's so much to do there's so much to get through in that day um to stand out is important because at the end of the day if you've got you know, sort of your your game on display on a table with with others, it needs to differentiate, it needs to appeal, it needs to excite. So without, and, but again, you need to be true to what the game is. So there's numerous ways in which we can help bring that to life so it's relevant and it appeals. 
Um, you know, I think that, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, that, I mean, obviously sort of a large corporate come out, but, you know, there's many, I mean, Hasbro obviously created the film and has opened the door to, you know, TTPR, TTRPG, like, no, they never have before. And, you know, a typical example of that is the fact that, you know, when wherever we're working with someone, they've always got, you know, the game is in mind and they may have a booklet or it might be a card game or whatever it is. But then it's like, well, you know, what else could you provide that from, you know, is it the fact that you've got your figurines? Is it something else that you could bolt on, you know, at PAX? Is it the fact, and I spoke to John with this, is it the fact that, you know, it's like a sales kit that we supply, um, you know, because people aren't always genuine salespeople, you know, sometimes they'd like to stay in their comfort zone. Um, but I think the beauty of being coupled with something like this is the fact that, especially when you're in a in an environment like PAX, is that there's a lot to see and, you know, there's always something shiny. So, I think having the ability to be able to provide a, a sales kit and look at how you can potentially get more from what your key audiences may want is, is super important. Um, so we can help in many different ways from looking at your audiences and how we can make it relevant, how we can make it appeal um, and how we can make it a site. And more to the point, how we can make it stand out and differentiate itself from other, other you know, sort of content and other games that are there. Okay. Uh, so from a more slightly more production uh, led uh, conversation. So um, we as an agency, we we can provide a lot of stuff, but first of all, from an ideas perspective, uh, you have your game developed, so what would uh, you bring to us before we can actually make it into market will really help if it's provided in a very clear and concise way. And if it's already been you know, edited by a game editor or already been proofread, and then if it's already been set up correctly for print, for example, is it set up correctly for a digital PDF, um, all that kind of thing. Um, so my role, as a artist, illustrator, and graphic designer here, um, I think it's really important that not only is the content um, ready for market, but also how it is displayed, whether it's on the page, uh, printed, or digital, or otherwise. Yeah, and I, and I think even with that, sort of to Joey's point, you know, there's so much that can be done. I mean, there's there's a lot of sameness out there. Mm. You know, last time I went to Comic Con, like there was so much, you know, you didn't know what to choose next. There was that much on the table. And I was saying to Joey that I went with the ambition of spending 400 bucks and I spent about two grand in the end. It was a bit overzealous. It was a bit overzealous. But the thing is, that was the reality. And, you know, I, without feeling my age, you know, I was like a kid in a sweet shop and I didn't know what to go to next. Um, but the thing is, and it's like anything, whether you're looking for clothes or you're buying a car, whatever, you, you, there's, you've got three seconds to capture somebody's attention, whether you're looking at a walking past the shop window. And I think you need to think about the same. If you're in a, a comic book store, you know, you're not be looking for certain things. But if you've got packs and you've got certain um, amounts, you might have 20, 30 games on a table you know, I'd have a think about how, you know, that's probably our job to bring that to life as well, to, to take your initial idea without ruining it. It's really just sort of more embellishing it. And, you know, how can we amplify that to make your game stand out and appeal and excite to the audiences that are relevant um, quickly and easily? So we've got three seconds. That's all you've got. You haven't got any longer. Um and then I think it's, you know, again, we can also help with the sales journey and, and you know, but I think that, you know, there's probably a five-year wave now, I would say. Now, Dungeons and Dragons have released what they've done. And, you know, as I was saying to John the other evening, my nephew, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, 
drinking pain here all the time. Um, my days of that have gone because I like to sleep at nights now. So, um, so for me, you know, but the beautiful thing about that is that there's money in gaming. There's money in being a developer. And not many years ago, but now with Dungeons & Dragons, what they've actually done, the T-shirts, for example, and the merch that he was buying, and this is just a quick example where like sort of 30, 40 bucks a time. Now it's Uncle Heath. I need to buy a signed version of one of the creators. And it was a T-shirt for £240. Um, but it was signed by one of the, the game creators. Who, so, so, And apparently there were five in the collection. So I think next week I'm going to get hit again. But all of a sudden, he doesn't put money on that. It's just a, a needed and wanted item because he's so... Um, invested, yeah, he's absolutely invested. Unfortunately, it's my money he's investing in, but even so, he's all very invested. Um, so I think that you know, there's so many ways in which you can sell, but I think you know, and that's one of the ways in which we can help you differentiate and channel who your key audiences are, so that when you do do so, when you put your game into market it's ready and it appeals and it's excites um, because, you know, potentially it's got the opportunity to fly. Um, so I suppose when we were sort of looking at the, when John contacted us previously, we were looking at what options there are out there for um, TTRPG gamers to, you know, sort of how can they get support um, and we were looking into this and the, the reality was at the time, there really wasn't very much option. I mean, there is for digital gaming, there is for board gaming, and there's, there's lots of money in that. But there didn't seem to be anything when we were looking into that, you know, I mean, apart from ARC now, obviously. <laughs> um, that's what I found. Joey? Yep. Uh, so... Obviously, with um, funding tools as one of the key points for this talk today, um, there's always uh, Patreon, which I'm sure everybody here knows about. Um, you may not get a lot. I'm not going to go like super in-depth for each of these because I'm sure most people already know, but just like from a little bit of tips perspective. Um, so Patreon, um, you might not get a huge funding from that, but sometimes having a Patreon as kind of like a journal or diary of keeping uh, your development and progress up to date can actually really help in getting funding because it, uh, it's almost like a credit score where you can almost show that, you know, you're committed, you've done the work, this is like what day one looked like and then how it goes. And obviously anyone who's interested along the way has as part of a Patreon subscription. Um, but yeah, it's not going to bring in the big bucks for that, but that's one avenue you can start with um, as step one. Uh, there's always a Kickstarter and Game Found for you know, crowd front, crowdfunding avenues as well. Um, if you're slightly starting out um, from a small scale perspective, uh, you could also try Co coffee k-o-f-i so um that's one of the little smaller platforms where it's kind of like a tipping service almost um then a bit of an out there one is youtube um so as part of uh ttrpg obviously learning how to play is a huge part of the industry and how you can get people connected and interested in your game so if you are able, YouTube might be a good avenue as well as a secondary or tertiary funding system if you can record like oh, how to play or uh, introductions and all of those kind of things to keep in your channel. That also helps as a promotional kind of material as well if you are trying to introduce new audiences to your games. Uh, that um, also ties into, you know, like what kind of social media helps in your game development. Mm. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, can sorry. <laughs> 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 we weren't bouncing very well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I think that, you know, one of the topics is that and we get it a lot is that, um, you know, people automatically shy away from sales or not thinking about that because they may not be great at marketing or they may not be genuine and, you know, salespeople at heart. Um, but I think that, you know, which is why we exist, really, because, like I said, we when we look at anything, whether it be a game that you're going to develop or whether it be, you know, or it's taking it to the next level, um, we identify everything from the very early offset. So we always have a strategy. Everything we do is driven by data or insight. So I think that as and when, you know, for the three games that we're going to start with, although we're looking at, you know, how we can get success for those three gamers and developers we're we're also looking at what also the bigger picture could be and we're not here to take anybody's um you know take it to steal anybody's stand or anything like that we're not there to change anyone's creative views or thoughts or anything all we're there here to do is is amplify it um so that and enhance it as and when we can. I mean, it might, as Joey said earlier, it might be copy, it might be illustration, it might be anything like that. So, you know, with with illustrators that we've got, with the graphic expertise we've got, um, we can pretty much do anything. So, um, and obviously there's always going to be a, a certain budget that we need to work within initially. Um, but, you know, success really is, is can be anything that we want it to be. But I think... The most important thing is making sure that your ideal audiences are going to pick your gamer, you know, and think it's about getting everything, doing everything possible to make sure that it will appeal, um, or at least you put the best foot forward. You know, there's different things, and and you know, we, you know, by you know, putting QR codes on your um, you know, one of some of you may have one or more games. It may be that, you know, my nephew crazy at the moment, but, you know, he's very much interested in the gamer and knowing where everything came from, the legacy, and he wants to know as much as possible about that. So anything you can do to drive people to your website, social, or, um, you know, to, to demonstrate what other games you've got available is all extremely valuable. Um, you know, so you need to think about cross-selling as upselling as well. Um, so, you know, it's the little things that sometimes matter in marketing. Uh, touching back on a little bit on um, what I mentioned previously, because um, one of the questions that I kind of got this uh, today in the Discord channel was, you know, as an indie game developer, you know, which social media platform should I be focusing on? Uh, so... I feel like before you even start with social media, what you kind of need to think about is, you know, how would you describe your game if someone walked up to the street and asked, oh, what are you doing? You know, you kind of want to have something right off the bat as like a summary. So you can just say, oh, okay, my game is X, Y, Z. It's almost like, you know, if um, an actor or an actress at a press release, you know, a uh, uh, reporter might come up and say, hey, tell us about the movie. And you just kind of want to have a short and prepared answer ready to go. And apart from that, you might also have a little kit prepared for a media kit that has uh, some of your logos, some of the artwork that you have prepared that people can just use on their website or in a news article, such as just little banners with your Facebook link, everything prepared so that if someone asks, hey, I want to do a news article, <clears throat> what can you tell me? And you have everything ready to go and just boom, here you go. This is the media kit. And let us know if you want more. Um, so these are like just one-off things that you can just start and finish and you don't have to really, you know, keep on updating or anything like that. It's just there and then it really helps you to focus on what you really need to do instead of just, hey, I suddenly need this for this reporter or, hey, I suddenly need something ready for packs and I don't have anything for, even though they said they wanted to do a blog on my game. So that's small stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, social media. So one of the factors would be you need to have your right, the right platform for your right audience. Um, for example, you know, TikTok's really hot right now, but 
unless your game really has a physical um, component to it, you know, mm -hmm. like throw a burrito or something, um, it's really not worth your time in mm -hmm. going to TikTok because it's not the right platform for the right audience. Mm -hmm. And I think with social, like any strategy, you don't need to use people, you know, people come to us all the time and, you know, thinking, oh, I've got to be on TikTok, I've got to be on Snapchat, I've got to, and you don't need to be on all things. You just need to be on the, the channels that are going to be relevant to your key and ideal audiences. Don't worry about your third and fourth audiences they'll get caught in the net anyway just focus on your prime and your secondary audiences because the thing is you know the time that you spent doing more of what works and less that what doesn't is our motto like there's no point in so if you've got particular business goal for your game or you've got desires and um inspiration for your game and you set yourself goals six months 12 months two years Two years will be a bit hazy, but, you know, ideally everybody's got a goal. Um, and then basically, you know, the marketing strategy should overlay over the top of that business or development goal and the two should marry so that, you know, you get to where you want to within a certain amount of time. And look, life's too short. If you spend, you know, you, who can cope with four or five platforms? Like it's, it's not... No, but yeah, I wouldn't bother, honestly. I'd, I'd focus on two and get it right and do it well than, than throw in a broad net into the sea hoping to get a large fish in when you can get through the net. There's no point. Um, I would focus on two channels and making sure that any of the channels that you're looking at are all the, the right channels for your audiences. Um, we can also help with a little bit of that as well because we've got literally hell of a lot of data lots of research and we know exactly who's on what what time what devices they're using everything um so we can pretty much paint a picture of pretty much any audience in the world um no matter what demographic they may be so we can certainly help with that part as well um, but like i said i think do more of what works and less what doesn't and don't cast your time you know I, um, whatever you're going to do, I do it well because mm. it it's not going to pay dividends if you don't. Yeah. So um, YouTube that I mentioned before is a good example. So uh, it's a really good channel to get um, new audiences and new players to your game, and also helps with um, any one who's interested but maybe has uh, some reading. Um, problems or attention issues, sometimes a video format would be really helpful and beneficial rather than, you know, a book, uh, especially for younger audiences as well. But as Heath mentioned with time, doing YouTube videos take a long time if you want to do properly. Yeah. So that's one of the pros and cons. So YouTube videos, you know, you need scripting, you need act, um, actors if you have more than one person playing, you need editing, that's a huge mm -hmm. production. So these are like some of the considerations that you probably want to take uh, in during your planning. So like, mm -hmm. what are the pros of this channel? What are the cons of the channel? Can I do this? You know, do I have a budget to do this? Um, usually uh, stuff like, websites and newsletters would also be the touchstone for any game if you have the budget to have your own hosting as well um yeah yeah and like i said i mean i think there are a multitude of channels that you can use and i think subject to what the game is subject to who your audience is and what your goals are i think it, it's about planning properly really and just maybe you know maybe i'll tell or you know seeking assistance once you know once you've defined who your audiences are because sometimes we go oh, you know everyone from 23 to 50 um you know but it's like a little bit more defined <laughs> you know that's a, a lot of people um you know and even if small percentage of those people were purchasing you know you, we'd all be multi-millionaires mm -hmm. you know so i think it's 
about choosing the channels wisely, identifying and being really truthful to yourself about who your audiences really are, and then focusing on the channels that they use. And, you know, it might only be that they're using three. And I would focus upon that because with any consumer, there's a consumer journey. There's obviously the awareness. People need to be aware of your game that it actually exists. It needs the consideration, um, you know, and that consideration could be one minute. It could be, you know, if they're at PAX, it could be two months if they're gifting or whatever the scenario is. Purchase repeat and then amplification is in you know they they want to tell people referral and they come back and do more so really that's the consumer shopper cycle which needs to be kind of considered um in order for you to succeed as well which sounds multi-layered but it's um you know but these are the processes that we're going through right now with the three gamers that we're working with and it's taking us a bit of time because we're, we're just getting all of that ready for them so um but yeah we pre- there's quite a lot of involvement um but yeah at least it then can go ready to market and it's got every every opportunity for success yeah and um if you're also looking at non-digital avenues uh you can also really um consider uh, apart from the large scale events like PAX or Conquest, um, you can also start going small. If you are a very small indie developer, you might start out as small things such as like a games night at a cafe or or a rest uh, or a club. Sometimes um, universities have gaming clubs for these kind of things. They might not specifically play your game. They might just be a D&D one. But sometimes it's also worth reaching out and see if they would be open to hosting, you know, like a one-off special or like an introduction session. Otherwise, you can also try the library. They are always looking for new events, new things to do. They would be uh, Hmm. very open to that. And then potentially, you know, just looking at opportunities, you can tap into their database and they'd probably more than be happy to send an EDM out on Mm. your behalf. I mean, you know, many many of you might not have large databases and things things as such. So I think based on what Joe just said, again, I think about organisations, community groups that do have, you know, your local soccer club, your local football club, your local school, Mm. your local, do do, do you know what I mean? And all of a sudden you're tapping in for the sake of five minutes work calling and introducing yourself sending a link you might get in their newsletter or to the college or whatever it might be it's going to cost you nothing yeah just a bit of time and effort Mm. um if your especially if your game is um kid friendly and family friendly you might also look into um those uh avenues or like therapy groups um like the game therapists Um, they would probably love to have some GMs drop by and just kind of have new games to play out as well. Um, And for anything that's, you know, a physical um, avenue like this, where you have an event, you can also um, probably invest in having physical things like flyers, you know, banners, stands and stuff like that, which will really help kind of, uh, solidify your presence as well so those um, promotional items that would help um, if for example a banner had your website had your QR code had your social media on it and um, cards that you can pass out to people so that oh it's on their mind if they have something physical to bring along with them home even if uh, you're not ready to sell the game yet if it's like a play test session for example so having um, stuff like that really helps as well to kind of build your brand. Um, I think that's pretty much from us. Uh, just go through. Um, it's also um, always worth taking a look at um, any kind of showcase or awards that are going on. Um, so you know, like PAX having the indie showcase or the collaboratory 
stuff like that where it's kind of, even if it's a group setting and you're just one game <coughs> setting, that's always a good way to boost you know your game as well um that's all the points i have here yeah. I think we're pretty much covered. Um, so hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into um, <laughs> where we can help. Well, hopefully it has anyway. Um, anything else from you, Joe? I think, no, I think we're covered. So we can open it up to questions if anybody's got any now. Uh, yeah, did you want to start with you? Sure. So, yeah. um, what are your thoughts and feelings on uh, offering um, sort of, you know, community copies of games once you have gotten to uh, physical development or, or digital development? Do you feel like that's a, a useful asset for game developers to get their, their brand or their game out there? Yeah, for sure. I think any... I, I think as long as there's not going to be a like an outward cost to you as such... Um, apart from, you know, whatever that may be, um, because I'd say the more people know about it and are playing it, the better. Um, as long as it wasn't going to cost you too much, then I'd say it's it's a great way of advertising. It's a great way of promoting. And, you know, it's the first step of the, um, you know, consumer job, shopper journey is awareness. So the more people that you, have, I mean, without giving it away to everyone, obviously, but certainly with those groups, then yes, absolutely. And it may be that you come to some agreement with them that if you're going to give that, they might give you a review and say how great it was or whatever that is. So it may be you do something where you get something in return, or it might be that if you are you know, giving the game um, to a community group, whatever it may be, it may be then you go, well, you know, would we, would you mind if we, you know... Had a uh, game night. You could have a game night. You, and again, you could potentially film some of that and put it on YouTube. You could potentially... There's so much you could do with it. But but yes, absolutely. So yes is the answer. Thank you. Can I test my volume? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can, yeah. Right. Um, this is going to sound like I'm ready to sell. I am not. Um, so I'm interested in the distribution channel. For example, if I have a, a book that I would like to sell as a TTRPG, I would like to be able to, anyone in the world to buy it, and then they pay for it, they get it shipped, right? Now, I've looked at different platforms like Gum, Gumroad. They charge like 10% of more. drive through RPG is even worse. You know, I think it's like 25%. So I've landed on Square, which their online platform charges 2% or less, maybe 1.7 in the POS physically. The problem is when I have to ship, now I'm kind of the bottleneck. If I'm traveling, if I'm doing other work, if I'm doing anything else, I can't physically ship that book to my customers. So is there any sort of intermediary distribution channel that could help me do this kind of thing rather than just me? Shipping books. Not that I'm aware, unless you hire someone. Okay. The distribution channels usually are kind of like the third party. Yeah, they so, normally take a percentage of. As you said, it can be costly. So if you are traveling, some especially when you know you're starting out, it might be easier to just pay a friend or relative for any orders that come through if you are away. Um, if you are physically sending them something that's tangible and, it, and it's physical. Um, but I don't know of anywhere that... No. You know. Unless you're talking large volumes and then the, the obviously the, the percentages are lower. Mm. Um, but no, it's, sometimes it's best to call upon friends, I think, and fellow gamers, and hopefully you can do the same for them. But I don't know of anything that's... No. That's out there that does that, actually. Yeah, it's almost like you have to probably depending on um obviously if you're talking about international you almost kind of have to find stockists to stock your book either in their warehouse or in their store yeah. to do that yeah and i think that when you when you grow into a larger scale and there's a there's a call upon that then there are um outlets that do that like a distrib like a distributor for each country or each region um, I know there are definitely are in Singapore, um, but, and maybe the same in China, but I'm not sure about other parts of the world. But yeah, certainly yes. Yeah, but I don't know of anywhere that don't charge a hefty that don't charge a hefty 
fee when you're starting out. No. Sorry. Yeah, all the EODs that I know of charge a ridiculous amount. Are we talking about fixed fees or equity? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> either, either. My, my suggestion to that, having been in that kind of a situation, is team up with another game developer who doesn't have the same travel schedule as you and quid pro quo. <laughs> So we have a couple of questions in chat. So I'm just going to start from the beginning. Um, so one question we've got is, how ready do we need to be before we approach you? If the book isn't in its final form yet, is it worth talking to you or should we wait until it's completely ready? I think, I think if you've got an idea, like a, a, a chat costs nothing, right? So I think that um, I would say if it's, as long as you've got sort of the, the context and you might be, you know, sort of two thirds the way through and almost there. So no, the, the answer is it hasn't got to be finished. You know, we can talk about what the concept is, what, you know, so no, it hasn't got to be finished at all. It's probably easier for us to, to talk to people before it's completely mm. finished so that if they do need a help in hand with whether it be illustration, whether it be writing, whether it, whatever, we, we can potentially assist with that too case by case yes obviously yeah. yeah but yeah so that's I'd probably say it's probably easier for yeah. us to do that because there may be you know we're all creative minds and I think that we'll be able to add that value to it once we you know sort of have a an overview and everything that we do here is you know all completely non-disclosure we never discuss anything outside four walls, um, everybody's heavily contracted, they're not allowed to do any of that. And they don't, you know, wouldn't be worth mm. the business. <laughs> so yes, at, at any point that somebody's willing to talk, then we're more than willing to open the door and, and have that initial chat. That's not a problem at all. Um, now, John, you had a couple of questions, one about the five year life cycle. Yeah, so Heath, you mentioned a five-year cycle for TTRPG, and I think you were referencing it to the, um, the massive growth around Dungeons and & Dragons and what spin-off, industry spin-off we might see from that. And I, we're certainly seeing like a much greater interest from government, from councils, from libraries, and from pop culture events in role-playing, as role-playing is growing it, people are seeing it not only as offering social benefits, but also actually bringing an audience. And that if, yours, if your pop culture event doesn't have some um, TTRPG, you look a bit lame. And so it's quite a new phenomenon, but you mentioned years. And I'm wondering, is that, are you drawing that from previous waves of enthusiasm around different phenomena, whether it was board gaming 10 years ago, whether it was some, you know, Pokemon or something, that things have a life in terms of this exponential growth period. And I guess I'm just interested in, you know, you've seen these things come and grow, go as a marketing, uh, in your marketing uh, um, career. And I'm just yeah. interested in how you see it playing out. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, you know, like with most things, um, you know, I think as soon as something sort of starts to hit, and so most things subject to, you know, sort of, so vehicles have a two-year life cycle, you know, there's perfume, fragrance, there's different things that have different cycles, and it's not always five years. But where it involves both, we call it both head and heart, in the fact that people get very invested, people, um, you know, have a lot of passion for what they do. And it's a bit like sort of COVID did exceptionally well for um, TTRPG as they did for some other board, as they did for board games as well. You know, like my, and again, jigsaws have gone up like three, I think something like 3,200%. Um, since COVID because people have gone back to basics. And I think that one thing that COVID did do 
is bring people together. People were able to form groups and community, you know, sort of you saw a, a slight uprising and wave when that was happening. Um, I think Joey didn't get any sleep at all through <laughs> COVID. But, you know, people were able to get together. And I think that since the, the positive COVID's had, and I think, yeah, we've probably got a five-year wave to ride on because things do tend to get tired. However, I'm not saying that it's going to phase out completely, but I think that getting on the, the board now, I think you'll find that where games are going into market now and and people are starting to think very carefully about who's going to purchase their games, how they're going to be marketed once it's successful and they've sold, you know, two, three, four, five thousand games. How can we then sell another five hundred thousand? And all of a sudden, with the with the wave that we're having and the realization that TTRPGs is fun and you know there's a you know and it's cool to be part of that. Um, you know, it's a bit of a phenomenon I mean, it'll keep on growing. But I reckon that sort of you've got probably three, three and three, three and a half years before it hits its absolute peak. And then I think it'll just sort of it, I don't think it'll necessarily phase out, but it you'll it may peak, you know, so it won't, it might reduce a little bit. Uh, but I'd say there's probably three years from now when it will reach its absolute peak. And then I think it'll just sort of start to digress a little bit. Um, so we have another question in chat. Uh, are you fine if we get this question out there, John, and then we'll cycle back to you about what a sales kit looks like? Yes, indeed. Uh, so one of the questions is, are there options for small RPGs, um, for example, one page RPGs, uh, or is it only for large world books? Um, what exactly do options mean as in like marketing options or? Um, just so, thinking, uh, so uh, yeah. if there could maybe just be some, just clarity and chat um i guess how how i personally interpret that is is it as viable for one for us let's say smaller rpgs and one page rpgs or is it just more for larger kind of books and art and sort of ttrpgs or does it not really matter uh, I, i'm reading the chat as well uh, um people who are asking questions who are online they should feel happy about um muting themselves and asking the questions. We just wanted people muted whilst the two of you were doing your main presentation. So the image didn't come around. Yeah, so that was, that was my question. And yeah, just because I have a one-page RPG that I released earlier, but obviously haven't had much traction with it. So it would, with your sales kit, would that be would that be useful for small RPGs or would it be for those kind of, you know, larger Kickstarter-backed ones that uh, have multiple people working on them? I, I think it's all about the idea. I mean, for me, you know, when we look at anybody that comes through the door, um, you know, no matter what size it might be, you know, you know, for me, it's all about the initial idea and how it can potentially be sold and marketed. Um, if, so I, I don't think it would be an issue necessarily. From my um, experience with one-page RPGs, um, I know that without knowing what game you're mentioning specifically, your price range of that probably wouldn't be very high. So a sales kit for that, a digital one might work, but a physical one will probably cost more than the actual RPG itself. However, you might also think about maybe having some sort of anthology type thing if you wanted to have a physical book with a sales kit to that maybe you know like a dan collection that has you know five one page rpgs for example that might help to balance out the cost and um benefits thank you that was what you were asking about <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, there was a Kickstarter earlier this year for a book of one-page RPGs. So as you guys were talking, I was thinking about that and uh, look what those options might mean in the future. 
Okay, so uh, John, you also had a question about what a sales kit looks like. Yeah, so again, that was mentioned earlier, but um, if I've got my, I'm running my game at PAX, um, and, I, you know, every two hours, um, six people sit down and play, so they've just had that um, positive experience with me as the game developer. Um, what would a sales kit look like that, um, that might capitalise on that opportunity? Uh, so there's a few different kinds depending on um, what kind of game you are and what size of a game slash developer you are. Uh, so the first one I mentioned before was a media kit. So that one is a digital kit that you can give out to um, anyone who wants to promote your game. You know, so that might look come in the form of um, banners like specifically for this social media or that social media or like social tiles. Uh, here's a banner for your newsletter. Here's some imagery that you can use to promote this game in your news article, something like that. Uh, so that's a digital version. Uh, then, um, as you said, from if someone went to an event and played a game and they didn't really like uh, the experience and they wanted to purchase something, your sales kit might be, oh, here is the core book. You know, here are some optional expansions you might want to include in it. Here's a sticker, you know, uh, here's a pin, stuff like that, like a merch mm -hmm. that, that can come in a bundle. So sometimes something like a bundle that's like, oh, if you purchase this kit now and because you play in person, you get a discount of blah, 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 blah. And you get all of this. So it's like providing a value add um, because I think that, you know, I, you know, and I've been to, you know, so I haven't been to PAX, but I've been to Comic-Con a few times. And, and I think that, you know, there's so many people that walk past and I think there's nothing better than a, you know, so if you've had six or eight people sitting down playing the game that have thoroughly enjoyed it, I'd probably say you've got 30 minutes while they're still in that moment to get three of them over there and purchase it, you know. And if you've got, you know, as you said, a, a, a kit that also gives them stickers, a pin, whatever it might be, then why wouldn't they? They're there to have fun and spend money anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I don't, and if you don't ask, you don't get, quite frankly. So, you know, I'd be, you know, prompting them to 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 buy the game there and then while in the heat of that moment, because you know, who goes to Pax and buys one game? Like nobody does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go there and, and go what's next and put it in the mm. bag and off you go. You know, so I think the I, I certainly don't think that, you know, there's nothing wrong with asking because if you don't ask, you don't get. And if you don't sell, you don't, you know, you don't get them to buy. Um, another kind of sales kit would be um, a kit that a company might have for a salesperson that they bring to potential uh, people who would then stock their products. So, for example, if I had a game and then I wanted the Quest suppliers to stock my game, I might have a, a set of sales kit that I as a salesperson might bring to show them. So that's a bit of a different one. Yeah. So it might have uh, like a, a flyer or a booklet for internal, and that's completely not connected to the actual players and the audience at all, but that's a little mm -hmm. bit more in the marketing realm. Yeah. And I think at the beginning of the game, when people sit down, I think it's a bit like when you sit down for dinner and look at a menu, you automatically know what you're going to do. So I think if, you know, before people start, you there's already something on the table or a kit or something there to basically say, you know, in, enjoy playing whatever it is you're going to play. And today is a special offer if you like it. You know, you already, you know, you can get this for, 40 bucks or 50 bucks, including pin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you're already, they're already aware of it before they start playing. So at the end of that play period, whether it be an hour or two hours or whatever it might be, they already know that it's available, what the offer is. So it should be an easy sell at the end when it's like, you know, how did it go? And, you know, here's a reminder, because you're more than likely find that it doesn't need to be a hard sell. If they enjoy it and they've liked playing with it, then why would you not just go and buy it? If you already know that 
you know, normally $70 now, 50, including a pin and badge or whatever it might be, mm. um, you know, it's there's no hard sell, you know, because some people don't like selling. They don't like, you know, going up like a, a used car salesman, um, you know, but it, it, not that it's like that, but it just makes it a lot easier if you people already know that the game's available and what options there are. Um, so there we go. I was going to ask if anyone at the table had a question. <laughs> um, okay, so I've, I've been doing RPGs for a number of years now, and one particular area that I struggle with is um, doing paid ads on social media, making that work. Ooh. First question is, is that something that you guys do? Um, so... I found that about eight years ago, I could go pretty well with a $100 ad and the lookalike list. So, you know, making it off my mailing list to get the stuff. Um, about a year ago, I've, I was about ready to give up. And a year ago, I thought, okay, I'm going to go one last try. And I went with a marketing agency, spent a bunch of thousands of dollars to do it, and I got a return. Okay. Um, so this has sent people to my Kickstarter. And I got money. Not great. A question for you, one... Is that what you do? Um, and is it possible to get good returns these days that doesn't just rely on luck? And I'd probably say yes. So I'll answer that in a, the fact that, you know, yes, we do do it. I mean, we pretty much cover everything from digital, creative, social media, media planning, buying, the whole gamut. Um, mm -hmm. And like anything, I don't think anything we do isn't based on luck. I think it's about having a really considered plan, knowing who your audiences are, because if you if you know you could go out there and spend a hundred dollars or a, a million dollars, you know, but if you don't know who your audiences are, and if you're not having got the right content and the right messaging, it will not work. But you need to, you need to know your audiences because you need to know where they dwell. In order to and where, when they're online, you need to know what they're what they absorb, and it might be varying channels. It could be different platforms because again, nobody's going to put anything in front of them. You know, a, a, you know, we need to get in front of the people that wish to buy, or you know, that will be interested and new game will appeal to. Get in front of those, and then with the messaging being right, with the right tone with the right voice and the right aesthetic from a creative perspective you know then it should be relatable and you you and again subject to your demographic will rely and you know we can normally give a pretty accurate um we can normally say if, if for example a game is 50 bucks and your objective within a year is to sell 500,000 copies or say 5,000 copies we can tell you how much you need to spend and what you need to do to get there. Is that just based off experience from you? Yeah, it's based on experience and insight that we have, yes. Because as I said, everything we do is data and insights driven. Like we don't, we never do luck here. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> hopefully I can't say that. I mean, sometimes we always have goals that objective and clients have objectives. But, you know, we're definitely not going to um, just tell people what they want to hear. Um, sometimes, you know, there's a few hard truths that we do say that, you know, this isn't going to appeal. You know, you know, we've people don't take into the fact that 62 percent of people are visual. One, eight, one in 10 men are colorblind. One in 20 women are colorblind. Nobody takes into account that, but it's super important from a game perspective, especially your covers, because at the end of the day, you've got three seconds. And on an ad on social media, you've probably got one and a half to two seconds because people flick through their, yeah, and they're inundated. So, you know, but however, it's not impossible to stop people in their tracks. You know, you might be walking through you know wherever you might be whether it be in a supermarket or going through Maya and all of a sudden you stop because there's the most amazing jacket you've ever seen you know but and it's a bit like that you know you'll stop if it appeals and it's relatable to you but to get them to consider and to part with money from their wallet or their purse 
is then going into that consideration factor. But if it's relatable, it's personable, and they feel that it's been created for them, you know, they'll more likely buy it because, you know, heart outweighs head most of the time. Just to add to that, sorry, as an ex-marketer, um, marketing agencies have a butt ton of data that you and I online don't have access to so they're able to make much better educated insights and, and um, assumptions based on their bevy of clients as well as super sneaky social media insights that they will have access to yeah, yeah. And which I is why it's difficult as a producer to know what you're doing a little bit what i found when the the company that i worked with i was like okay this is no longer in my realm of something that i can do yeah, which is yeah. why you need someone who's going to tell you whether or not what you think is going to work is actually going to work because they've got all the data that you don't have. And I think it's really important as well. Not everybody makes a decision on the first thing that they see. For example, it might be that they like the ad that you serve them, but they, you know, you've got those who are impulse and go, yeah, I'm doing it now and I'm going to sign up now. Thank you very much. And you've got those who go, I'll come back to that tomorrow and they need to consider a bit longer. And it might be that they then go from the social ad to the website, because you may have two games, three games, or they might want to know a little bit more about you first, um, you know, and about the game, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there might be two or three steps from convert, so from awareness to purchase, um, but all of them are very interconnected because once you've got somebody in that net and they've purchased from you, you know, they're super, super valuable because really they could be loyalists and advocates. You know, you really want that one, that person to do is then amplify how amazing your game is. So for every one person, so for every five people they tell, you know, or reviews that you get, you know, that person's like gold. You know, the experience just needs to be good. But like I said, two, three, but especially if you're serving different creatives, the creative is king. Content, you know, again, is is queen. It, it's really important. And you can't have, you know, you're not going to succeed without considered messaging or creative. I wouldn't waste the money doing that. Um, I think, it, and again, you don't, but however, good creative doesn't need to be expensive. It just needs to be considered relevant and strong enough to appeal and excite. Because if somebody is excited, and, and the thing is, subject to how much the game is, whether it be $10, $30, $50, you know, the, the more it creeps up, probably the more the consideration comes in maybe. But again, head, um, heart weighs head. So if they feel that it's something they must have, want to have, and want to be part of, they're more than likely going to purchase anyway. They might just need to do a bit of exploration first. So that's why I think website, whether it be one page or it's a little bit more detailed is important. And as Joey said earlier, having a considered, concise, short, sharp message that packs a punch to describe what your game is, what it's about, is crucial. You know, because it's like, um, you know, that's why companies spend so much on strap lines and having considered messaging so that it doesn't get lost in translation, you know, so, or get like Chinese whispers. So I think having something that's, you know, 10 to 12 words that you can remember and more to the point, if you, you know, one of your friends then tells somebody else that they will also get right. It doesn't need to be word for word, but at least, you the know, message. Somebody, the message gets through. Um, so I'd probably say, you know, messaging, creative, and making sure that you're in the path of those audiences is crucial. Um, and it, like I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, <clears throat> tens of thousands or anything like that, you know, because, you know, you know, from small hills, large mountains, you know, I think it's just a case of making sure that whatever you do from a marketing perspective is considered because sometimes it's worth putting that extra little bit of investment in and time to make sure it's right. You know, and I think that a lot of 
businesses and and, and you know as a gamer you, you are a business because at the end of the day you want to sell you want to you know get as many people playing the product as possible so I think it's really important to also put your audience hat on a little bit um, when you're going through that process and go you know and be very truthful in the fact that if that was on the shelf with another 30 would I buy it mm. and then you know then you've got the pros of why you would and if you've got more cons than why you wouldn't, then you need to reinvent a little bit, I would say. Yeah. So if anybody has a super quick question, we might be able to squeeze that through. The last one. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if a developer's coming to you, what would you say are the five things they should bring to you? Um a clear and concise idea. Um, a, an idea of who their audience is, I think, is really important. It, just, it hasn't got to be, you, you know, because we can work out all the demographics and everything. But if you had to sort of put into words who you'd, you know, who your ideal audience would be, I'd say is that that would be important. Um, I think what is success to you is another um you know because people are driven by different things and at the end of the day whether you're spending time or whether we are in time or money or whatever that is I think success is important um so what would success be in and we always when we're putting strategies together for any client no matter what size we always look at what are the goals what are your goals whether it be for sales or monetary whatever it be in the next six months 12 months and then we also ask the next three and then three years. Three years is there because that allows the game to amplify and allows us to consider from the offset where it could possibly go. Because a lot of companies and a lot of businesses and a lot of games only think about the here and now, but you need to think about where it could possibly go or where you would like to take it. You know, what's that nirvana? What would that be? that amazing moment where you go, oh my God, I've made it. Because potentially, you know, everybody's got the opportunity to succeed. Um, you know, it could be all the retirement fund, you know, for goodness sake, you know. So I think it's, yeah, super important to be considered. Um, I'll give an example, I guess. So um, maybe um, first your idea would be, the, oh, I have this game. My game is about so-and-so. And I, for example, this game will also help children learn Spanish. So therefore, that's a key thing that we would like to know. So we can yeah. then help you with your strategy. And that will also help define, you know, if it's teaching children Spanish as part of one of the core things, then obviously your target audience is going to lean younger and also towards families. So it's stuff like that that kind of helps us build a picture yeah. of like what you want. Yeah. So a clear descriptor or definition of the game, um, idea of audience, um, goals and outcomes that you'd like to achieve, both from a a, a game or, or business perspective, as in production. And, and you know, because at the end of the day, you're in control. Like any marketing agency of their worth, um, you know, that business plan, I suppose, is important. It doesn't have to be chapter and verse or anything it's more about where ideally you know what is success and where would you like to take the game because again that will determine the plans and steps to be taken um over a period of time to get you to the goals that you want within that time period uh and expectation so um like if you needed help finding um, an artist or an illustrator to do the artwork if if that's something you want us to help you with for example or you know if you already had the artwork that's also two separate things yeah yeah but as an agency I mean, we we're here to help businesses and individuals really achieve ob objectives so the more you can give us the better really um and we normally have like a briefing session to get a full understanding of what it is that you want so um yeah and we work hand in hand with people you know we've got no e egos here there's no um you know we just like success for our clients really that's what we live for 
as well as having fun and you know, all the other things come with it. But yeah, you know, for us, it's um, really just about, you know, we work with a lot of small businesses that, you know, some agencies probably wouldn't give the time of day, to be perfectly honest. But for us, you know, from um, small acorns, big trees grow. Um, you know, a typical example of that was that, you know, I started working with Alexander McQueen, uh, 20 years ago, um, 25 years ago, just before. And, you know, we were working and eating pizza in his garage and I was sending copy material. And, you know, four years later, he was director, creative director for Chanel. And five years after that, we were in Milan and he was spending $3 million a year with us. So, you know, things happen. Oh, well, I think that's a, a great point to end the night. Um, uh, John, was there anything else that you wanted to announce before everybody logs off? Um, no, but just again, a thanks to um, Heath and Joey. Um, meaning, um, that sort of insight, just getting, you know, attention from a, a group of uh, professionals like yourselves or what is um, a small hobby-based activity like ours um, is really um, exceptional, and I'm just hugely grateful. Yeah. Oh, you're very welcome. No pleasure. So. All right. Well, um, let's all say good night. Um, have a wonderful evening. And yeah, thank you again, Heath and Joey. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Very well. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great night, everyone. See you. See you.